Welcome to lesson 65 of Hunger and Thirst for Righteousness. It's called No Civil War. Um, I feel very blessed to be able to do this with you guys. I'm happy to be back and back recording right now. And so um, hopefully we can get a good slew of lessons in um, together. And we'll go ahead and keep going here, okay? It's called No Civil War. A really great lesson, really great lesson. So it says it's 1 Kings 12, 16 and 19. When all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now look after your own house, David. So Israel departs to their tents, but as for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death. And King Rehoboam made haste to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem, so Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. To this day. It came about when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, that they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. None but the tribe of Judah followed the house of David. Now when Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and all the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin and, the, and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, You must not go up and fight against your relatives, the sons of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing has come from me. So they listened to the word of the Lord and returned and went their way according to the word of the Lord. Okay. And so this is a really, really, really great story here because this is about civil war. This is about going against his relatives, the, their brothers. This is, this is a people that are fighting against each other. And this is a very needed lesson for those that are in Christ. For those that are in Christ. Now, we're going to notice that Israel, it says Israel is in rebellion. Let me go back. Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. So there's something very specific about Israel in the house of David. Israel can be likened in this, in this to the body. This is the majority. This is the crowd. This is the, uh, the nation. Okay, this is the holy nation. But there's something set apart about the house of David. About the house of David. And so we're going to read this next. It's going to give us a little more insight. Second Samuel 5, 7. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion. That is the city of David. So we know that Zion is associated with David. The city of David is Zion. The house of David is associated with Zion. It's associated with Zion. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper into the spirit about this notion about the house of David. And we have the people of God who are called Israel at this point. A little bit deeper. Revelation 14, it says, Then I looked and behold, the land was standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his name in the name of his father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and for the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who have been purchased from the earth. These are those who have not been defiled with women, for they kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from, from among men as first fruits to God and to the lamb, and no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. So now we're going to go back to because in the spirit we have this vision where we have we look and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion and with him one hundred and forty four thousand. This is the bottom line revealed truth about the chosen, the set apart, the set apart people from the set apart people. Because we understand that all of God's people are set apart from the world. But these chosen bond servants of God 
are set apart even from the nation, from the crowd of the set apart people of God. But there's some things about them I want you to notice. Since they sang a new song, no one could learn the song except the 144,000. This is a parable. This song is a song of word. It's something that they know. It's something they understand. It's something that flows from their lips that only they can understand. The rest of the people could not understand this. Only they could understand it. Only they can understand it. And so we're going to keep reading about these people. There's a little bit more in here. We're going to go back to Revelation 7. We're going to talk a little bit more about these people specifically. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. 12,000 were sealed. And so, why am I giving you this? Because from Israel, who is the people of God, these people are chosen from the 12 tribes of Israel. They are the chosen of the chosen. Is it everybody? I'm going to put this to you plainly for us in Christ. And today is the truth and spirit. Everybody who believes in Jesus is set apart, is chosen. But there are things in this Bible, if you read deeper, it talks about there's a holy place in the temple and there's a holiest of holies. These 144,000 are, are of the holy, holiest of holies. Now let's keep going. We're going to read a little bit more. Revelation 16, 13 to 16 says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out, which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Bless the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not, will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew was called Armageddon. Now, as we're talking about this, why am I bringing this up? Why am I bringing this up? Because we have to understand and discern who it is that God is going to wage a war against and who he's not. Who he's not. These people who are, are following the dragon, these people who have found the beast, these people who have found the false prophet, it literally says that these are people of the world and they're being gathered them together to the place which is called Armageddon. They're being gathered for the war of the great day of God. This is essentially every last person that does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus came in the flesh, that Jesus is Lord. This is these are all these, these are these people. Now, that belief also is a little bit, it, 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 it can it can get deeper because we understand that there's, you know, you read the Bible, you understand there's there's deeds that show your belief, there's fruit that shows your belief. So just like it says in the Bible, you can't really believe everyone says, I love God. That's the truth. But we, we, we're going to keep it simple today and we'll get, get deeper into those things later. OK. But these are the people who are going. These are the people who are going to wage war against God. These are people that God is going to be willing to fight against in the great day of God, the day of Elohim, the day of Yahweh Elohim. 
Moving on to Revelation 17, these will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And now listen to the rest of this. And those who are with him are called the, co the called and chosen and faithful. So why am I reading this? Because you have to understand that these 144,000 are the ones who were with him. They're the ones who you saw on the mountain in Mount Zion. They were with the lamb and they will come and they are warriors. <laughs> They're warriors. So we're going to go back up to the word of God. It says, but the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, right? And he told them. You must not go up and fight against your relatives, the sons of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing has come from me. Now, notice, notice that he did not go to the body, the, the nation, the crowd, which uh, in this situation we're, we're calling Israel. He spoke this word to the house of David. So what we just talked about, these people of this house of David are people who understand things that the others do not understand. He did not go to the deaf and the people who cannot hear and the blind. He didn't go to them. He went to those that can hear and that can see and told them, do not go and wage war against your relatives. It specifically says this thing has come from me. I don't care how disobedient they are. I don't care how much they come against you. And it literally says they uh, they they stoned the messenger, right? I don't care if they kill someone, one of your people. They stone, they persecute them. Do not wage war against them. Do not wage war against them. But why, why would he go to them? Not only is he going to them because they see and because they hear, but he's also going to them because these are his warriors. They're his valley, the house of David, Zion, the men of Zion are valiant warriors that the, the nation and crowd stand no chance against. It's like telling a group of civilians to go and fight against a well-armored army that has tanks, that has guns, they have all these things. The, the Lord is going to show up to that army and say, do not go against those civilians. That is what he is telling them. Do not go against your, your relatives, the civilians, the people you're actually supposed to be fighting for. Regardless of how they treat you. And if you read this Bible, you understand that the set apart of the set apart they're always going to be judged, they're always going to be persecuted, they're always going to be uh, stepped against by um, the rest of the people. We have Joseph, his 11 brothers. What do they do? They sold him into slavery. They came against him. They persecuted him. Uh, when he was blessed by his father, it literally says that he is the one who is distinguished amongst his brothers. So the one they could hear, the one they could see was being persecuted. But did Joseph wage war against his brothers? No, he did not. Moses, who once again, we know was set apart and set apart because the sons of Israel didn't even want to hear God speak. They were so scared. Only Moses was actually able to come near to God. We know that he was a set apart, set apart. And if you read his story, he was persecuted at least 10 times. I need to do a concrete count on that pretty soon and we'll talk about that. But this man was persecuted over and over again, not only when he went to go pick them up out of Egypt, but then once he did all the wonders and they, they go in the wilderness, immediately he's persecuted again. They say, why did you bring us out here to die? His sister persecutes him for, for taking his second wife. Um, the, the, the daughters, of, the sons of Korah uh, uh, persecute him and they get swallowed up in the wilderness. And this happens over and over and over and over and over again. But did Moses wage war against those people? Did the one who could hear and could see, did he wage war against them? No, he didn't. He prayed for them.
He prayed for him. Last example I want to give you, and we'll move on in our um, we'll move on in our our lesson here. Last example I want to give you: we have Jesus, who literally says, who literally talks about the people in this time, says that that they do not have ears to see, I mean ears to hear, and nor eyes to see, and he's persecuted over and over and over again. He's called demon possessed. He's called um, what else is he called? He's called. Da, 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 a blasphemer. But the funny thing about Jesus is you never see him talk about, say that towards the people that are actually those things. The people he came to die for, the people he came to love, he never speaks against those people, never comes against them, never wages war against them. Tells Peter to put down your sword. Put down your sword. So this is a really good lesson, not only for the distinguished, but also for the crowd, for the body. And so let's go ahead and keep this going. So once again, we we'll read the end of this. this is, Those who are with him are called the called, the cho uh, and chosen, and faithful. So these men of Zion are with him and they are going to fight the war of God with the lamb. Only 144,000, which is very powerful in itself. You're learning about how powerful, just how powerful, just how powerful these men of Zion are. Because we're going to look at some stats in a second. We'll look at some stats in a second. As we watch a video here, and um, obviously I didn't want to to bring about a um, you know a, a bloody real video, so we're gonna watch a cartoon, okay? But we're gonna watch a video because I want you guys to visualize the strength of the men of Zion, the strength of the men of Zion, and why, if you possess this strength. You, the Lord is talking to you and he's telling you, do not go to war against your brothers and sisters. Do not go to war against the, the body of Christ. Do not go to war against the crowds of believers. Do not go to war against Israel. Don't do it. Don't do it. There is a day for your strength to be revealed and it's not against the body of Christ. No matter how ignorant of things you may hear, no matter how much you're persecuted, no matter how much you're hated, no matter how much you're gossiped about, no matter how much, no matter how much rebellion you receive. Do not do it. Now we're going to look into the spirit at the body, at the crowd. So we've looked in the spirit and we've seen the 144,000. We know their role. We know that they're with the Lamb on Mount Zion. We know these are men of Zion. We know they come back and they go to war with Christ. We know these things. But now let's look at the body. It says in Revelation 7, 9 to 10, after these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation, all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answers saying to me, these are these who are clothed in the white robes. Who are they and where have they come from? I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. 
They will hunger no longer nor thirst anymore, nor will the sun beat down on them nor any heat for the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Every tear from their eyes. And so we have to understand this reality. And this is something that most, uh, this is very good for the body to hear. And it's also very good for those who are chosen bond servants of God. Because I'm not going to act like they don't exist. There are some of you who are alive today. And this is what my ministry is catered towards, is towards you. You. To the body of Christ, you've got to realize there are people in the kingdom of, of, he of heaven that understand things you do not understand. That see things you do not see and hear things you do not hear. This is why you must become obedient to the command of love. Because although you don't see and although you don't hear, everybody knows what love is. Treat others how you want to be treated. Do you want to be treated that way? If not, leave the people alone, body of Christ. If you see how Jesus walked, you never saw him persecute a soul. You never saw him yell blasphemy at a soul. You never saw him condemn anybody. You never saw it. And to the chosen bond servant of God, you can be frustrated sometimes. You can be frustrated at the ignorance that they don't see what you see and they don't hear what you hear. And you're like, it's so plain. It's so clear. It's right here. He did not give them eyes to see nor ears to hear. You have to respect God's choice and you have to become strong enough to endure persecution by your own brothers. That's what the scriptures are for, to help you endure. To help you endure. And so we're about to get into this video in one second. I'm going to give you one more scripture. Joshua 23, 10. It says this. One of your men puts to fight a thousand for the Lord your God is he who fights for you just as he promised you. You understand this is that the, these men of Zion, they are nothing to be played with. They are nothing to be played with. One of them puts to fight thousands. It says a thousand thousands. A thousand is a modest number in this case. I wanted to provide a video for us as an example of one Zion warrior and how strong, how capable one Zion war warrior truly is. Um, I was not able to provide that video because of a copyright claim, but I'm going to talk to you over some screenshots just to talk about this. You know, in this video, which I was given a cartoon for you, I want to use a very uh, a bloody um, real uh, video to, to show this but in this video we have one man versus a whole army we have to understand we were just reading verses about how essentially everyone who does not believe in christ is going to assemble themselves for a great war against god and you have to understand it literally says in here it says in here that there have been roughly 117 billion people that have ever lived 117 billion, roughly 117 billion people. 69% of those people are non-believers. That's 80 billion, 730 million people that are going to assemble themselves against God. And Yahweh has decided that he has chosen 144,000 to go to war against 80 billion, 730 million people. So you can only imagine how strong each of them is. And just like I said, when I first recorded this video, is understanding that he doesn't even need anyone else. Honestly, this is for show. He's even choosing 144,000 people because he won against everybody would win. But I want you to imagine the strength of a Zion warrior, how spiritually strong these people truly are. 
And also we have another click where it says the power of one Zion warrior. So the power of one Zion warrior, one of 144,000. One Zion warrior is showing up to conquer 560,625 men by, its, by oneself. That's how strong one Zion warrior is. He's capable of conquering 560,625 men. And I wish I could play this clip for you because you see just how powerful this one warrior was against his whole army. It's a great visual of seeing uh, what a Zion warrior would be. But if you can tell from the screenshots, these people have no hope against this one warrior. In the same way, there is no hope for a, for a single man against a Zion warrior. And this last clip is just for show, just to show you how powerful this one warrior was in this uh, cartoon. He literally brings down a planet from the sky. And these people are asking, is this a power of a god? Like, what is this? This is amazing. But I'm trying to give you a visual of just how strong one Zion warrior is. And so let's go ahead, go ahead and continue on with the lesson. Now, we're going back to this notion that we were just talking about a second ago about how these chosen men of Zion, it says they know they have a song that only they can understand. This is a parable he's trying to tell you that they have ears to hear and they see things. They have understanding that the rest of the body, the rest of the rest of the crowd does not have. That's reality. That's reality. Matthew 13, 10 to 12. And disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, to you has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has to him more should be given and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because while seeing they do not see and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they will see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So once again, this is a great understanding that Jesus is offering is saying that his disciples and the disciples, these are the people who give everything to follow him. Notice that it says about those men on Mount Zion that they follow the lamb wherever he goes. So these disciples are a great parable for men of Zion, not only a parable, but they are uh, uh, the, essentially it says they will judge the twelve tribes of Israel. They are the ones who judge who's worthy of being in the, the 144,000. But he says they have eyes to see, they have ears to hear and they understand. He doesn't talk to them in parables. They, they get it. So this is a reality is that with this type of chasm between disciples in the crowd, there are going to be issues, but this is why he addresses the disciple. He addresses the men of Mount Zion. He does not address the body and tell them do not go to war with them. He told he came to the 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 the, uh, the house of David and told them do not go to war with Israel. But this is why I offer you this wisdom. First John 4, 1 and 2, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now, very great scripture, because guess what? If you listen, I, I promise you. If you believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh and he died on the cross and rose again on three days, I will never set myself against you. I will never. Do I even myself personally have times of frustration that people just don't understand? It's hard not to be frustrated sometimes. It is. Even, even if you know the truth, it's hard not to be frustrated. But will I ever 
expose myself and, and, and enter into spiritual warfare, enter into debate, enter into dispute, enter in uh, 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 with another person who believed that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? No, because what does it say? It's from God. Their spirit is from God. And this is why you need the wisdom of sanctification. It brings much um, sanctification and epochs. They bring much mercy to your heart when you understand the different levels that people are at, the different days that people are on. But everyone that confessed that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. I would never come against, never. Because at that point, you have to understand, you're not coming against them. You're coming against God. And that is what the house of David, he was telling the house of David. Although I am mightily with you, although you are my valiant warriors, although you are my chosen to set apart of set apart. I am not with you going against your relatives, no matter how weak they are. And this is why Jesus talks about. Whether what you do to the least of his brothers and sisters, you do to him. And I'm if you really understand, you know, the least all they do is fear the Lord. They don't have knowledge. They don't have strength. They don't have counsel. They don't have understanding. They don't have wisdom and they don't know him at all. But because they fear the Lord. That spirit is from God, it is the, the base spirit of God, the fear of the Lord. It is the base thing that it says in this word of God in Jeremiah, I believe, 32, 40. It literally says that he will put his spirit in us that will cause us to fear him so that we do not turn away from him so that he may do us good. It's the base minimum of every believer is that they fear God. But when you understand this, You'll see more clearly that there are more people who are of God than you think are of God. And there's also less people of God than, than you think are of God. And I'm not sure how to explain how those two things go together, but they do. There are more people that are of God than you think are of God. And there are less people of God than you think are of God. Interesting, right? And so we're going to go here because once again, we talk about a chasm, chasms, chasm is like a, how do we say this? A chasm is, 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 uh, is most blatantly, um, brought into our attention in a parable in Luke when Jesus is given the parable of the rich man and Lazarus and the man goes to, to hell essentially and the other and, and Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom and there's a chasm between him that they cannot cross over. He cannot cross over into Abraham's bosom. And Abraham's Bosom cannot cross over into, into hell, essentially. But these chasms are real things that people are experiencing today. It's a boundary. You read in the law of God, it says, curse the man who moves a neighbor's boundary mark. There are spiritual boundaries for believers that if you are, a, are not a disciple, if you're not a chosen man of a bond servant of God, you can only go so far, and I'm just telling you the truth. Then the many of the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, now the situation of this city is, is pleasant, and as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, Bring me a new jar and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. He went out to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have purified these waters. There should not be from their death or unfruitfulness any longer. So the waters have been purified to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. Now, if you understand the Bible, you know, day means yom. It means time period. It means a uh, it means time period. It means a, a, a zone of time. Now, if you understand also, we've talked about this a, a lot of times. So I'm not putting all these verses on here. These these lessons are supposed to accumulate for you. So I don't have to keep going back and saying the same thing. But if you go down to Revelation, we know that the waters are parables for the nations and peoples and tribes. That's, that's the people. But he says the, the, the waters have been purified to this day. It takes a lot of spiritual wisdom to understand that when you're reading these books in, in the Kings, this is the fourth day he's talking about. 
which means the crowds have access to fear the Lord. They have access to knowledge. They have access to strength. They have access to counsel, but they do not have access to understanding wisdom or the fullness of the spirit of Yahweh. They do not. Yet they are still fruitful. And there's a lot to say about that because we know that the fourth command of being in the story of creation, we have let there be lights, the first one, let there be an expense, the second one, let there be solid land is the third one. The fourth one is let there be, what is it? Let, the, let there be vegetation, let there be fruit, let there be trees. So the, the fourth one is a command to let there be fruit. They've been purified to the point of being able to become fruitful. That's the truth. That's the truth. And we know that also when you cross over into the fourth day, you have the fifth command. And he says that let the sun, the moon, the stars, they're governing forces, right? They are leaders. Disciples are leaders. They are leaders. Disciples are leaders. We know the moon is actually a, 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 the, a, a controls the tides of the world, the waters. So, yes, there's a difference in, 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 in the chasm. There's a spiritual chasm between the, uh, the, the crowds of people and disciples. And it's funny because the, the fifth fruitful quality in Christ that Peter gives us is godliness. The fifth beatitude is blessed with the merciful. You're not going to find true mercy amongst the crowds, which is why. The, the Yahweh does not address the crowds about going into war against the house of David. He addresses the house of David about going into war against the crowds. Why? Because he expects mercy from them. He does not expect it from the crowds. There's a chasm. It's not there. Now, this is the last thing I want to give you, because this is what I want you to understand. This is a, a chosen bond servant of God, we're going to read Numbers 16, this story, okay? We're going to read this story together. It's quite a bit reading, but we'll get done reading this and we'll be done for the day, pretty much. We got about two scriptures after that. But why am I giving this to you? Because you have to understand that as a chosen bond servant of God, even amongst the people, you have to trust Yahweh to discipline and correct his crowds. And that is not for you to do. It's not for you to go and say, okay, I'm going to pull out my sword. I'm going to show them who's boss. I'm going to humble them. That's not your job. Trust Yahweh to do this for you. So let's read it. Now, Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Kahav, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Peleb, the sons of sons of Reuben, took ash, action, and they rose up before Moses together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, chosen in the assembly, men of renown. They assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? When Moses heard this, he fell on his face and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to himself. Even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Do this, take censers for yourselves, Korah and all your company, and put fire in them, and lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is, is it not enough for you that God that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to And that he has brought you near Korah and all your brothers, sons of Levi with you. And are you seeking for the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. But as for Aaron, who is he that you grumble against him? Then Moses sent a summons to Dathan um, uh, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. But they said, we will not come up. Is, is it not? Is it not enough that you have brought us up out of the land flown with milk and honey to have us die in the wilderness? But you would also lord it over us. Indeed, you have not brought us into a land flown with milk and honey, nor have you given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Would you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up.
Then Moses became very angry and said to the Lord, Do not regard their offering. I have not taken a single donkey from them, nor have I done harm to any of them. Moses said to Korah, You and all your company be present before the Lord tomorrow, both you and they along with Aaron. Each of you take his fire pan and put, and put incense on it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 fire pans, also you and Aaron shall each bring his fire pan. So they took his own censer and put fire on it and laid incense on it. And they stood at the doorway of the tent of the meeting with Moses and Aaron. Thus Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the doorway of the tent of the meeting. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them instantly. But they fell on their faces and said, O God, God, the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dothan, and Abiram. Then Moses arose and went to Dothan and Abiram with the elders of Israel following him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them, or you will be swept away in all their sin. So they got back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dothan, and Abiram, and Dothan and Abiram came out and stood the doorway of their, of their tents, along with their wives and their sons and their little ones. Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But the Lord brings about an entirely new thing and the ground opens his mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs and they descend alive into Sheol. Then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open and the earth opened his mouth and swallowed them up in their households and all the men who belonged to Kor with their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. All Israel who were around them fled at their outcry, for they said, The earth may swallow us up. Fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. Awesome. So the point of this story I read it to you, so for you to understand, is that the, the Lord is going to show, if you are a chosen bond servant of God and you hear and you see, and we notice also this, this envy of, the, you know, we're all holy, we're all holy. Why are you separating yourself? Who separated him? The truth separated us. As the reality is, is there is any 144,000 and there's a crowd. Some people cannot accept that not everybody that believes in Jesus is in the same level of relationship with him. And I want to give you this because as people in the crowd, you need to hear this. They've seen the people he felt compassion for them because they were distressed in the spirit like she without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. He wants workers to go out and that's his compassion on you. That's his compassion on you. So for you to come against the worker of God that he's sending to you, you are you are denying his compassion on your life. And we'll end off with this and those with the end. Matthew 23, 37, 39. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I want to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this is an important attitude that you need to begin to have. And if you want to see the Lord and the reality is everyone is not chosen to come near to him as the disciples were. They were not chosen. Everyone was not chosen to be able to hear and see beyond the parables. But if this is the truth, he's trying to say to you that you will see him when you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That as long as you are skeptical about receiving the word of the Lord, as long as you are skeptical, skeptical 
about uh, uh, receiving those the word of God show is saying um, are truly from him. That it says that those who are enlightened speak from the law and the testimony. As long as you are still denying those people, you will not see him. You will not see him. And so this was a very good lesson called No Civil War. I hope you learned something today and I hope that this brings mercy to your heart for those that are in the crowds towards God's workers, but also God's workers. I hope this brings mercy to your heart towards the crowds who may ignorant, ignorantly be persecuting you, you know, calling you all types of evils, whatever it is. You have to understand the truth will help you. The truth will help you. And so we do tithing offering. MFH pulls eight hundred dollars a week to ensure that God's work can and will continue through this ministry. The rest will be redistributed, redistributed back out to evenly back out to those that gave. We'll be the first to bless you. That's cash app money sign Christ King Way. That's PayPal at MFH Ministry. It's a blessing doing this with you today, and I'll be back soon. Lesson sixty six, lesson sixty five. No civil war. Be blessed.